Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I request you all to kindly please take your seats. Uh, now we are going on for our next session. Well, this is going to be the elephant in the room. Yes, you heard me right. Uh, no. So, why elephants and environment matters for national media, senior journalists and editors. We're going to take this subject forward. The media plays an extremely important role on how the animals are projected to the masses and policy makers to affect minds that shape that policy. Has the media been taking up that responsibility to project what elephants are in terms of their ecological, cultural, and religious roles? The very August panel is uh, here, discusses the imperatives. So ladies and gentlemen, with this now I would like to call our next set of panelists on stage with us. I request everybody from back uh, to kindly please take the seats, to please come forward and take the seats. May I please request everyone to kindly please settle down? Thank you. All right, so we have with us, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Raj Chengappa, who's a veteran journalist of over 40 years standing. He's currently the group editorial director, publishing of India Today Group, Asia's leading media house with interest in publishing, television, radio, and the web. India Today, its flagship is Asia's largest circulated news magazine. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Mr. Raj Chenagapa. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for coming here. We have with us Mr. Sukumar Ranganathan, Editor-in-Chief of Hindustan Times. Prior to Hindustan Times, was with Mint since 2006, became its editor in December 2008. Before Mint, Ranganathan was the Managing Editor of Business Today magazine. He's a chemical engineer from Bits Bilani, whose interests range from flora, fauna to music. So a very warm welcome to you. We have with us Mr. Rahul Karmakar, a journalist of repute who has written extensively on subjects, especially in Northeast India. He's presently the senior editor of the English Daily Hindu. A very warm welcome to you, sir. Thank you so much for your presence. And we have with us Mrs. Mrinal Pandey, Eminent media personality, Mrinal Pandey has vast experience spearheading several prominent governmental and non-governmental bodies. She is India's first woman chief editor of multi-edition Hindu Daily, Hindustan, Hindustan Times Group, and is former chairman of India's national broadcaster, Prasad Bharti. She was awarded Padma Shri in 2006 for her services in the field of journalism, the Red Ink Lifetime Achievement Award by the Mumbai Press Club in 2014, and a Lifetime Achievement Award by the Press Council of India in December 2016. She is also a trustee of the Wildlife Trust of India. Can we please give a big hand? <laughs> so with this, I request Mrs. Uh, Mrinal Pandey to take this conversation forward. Can we please give a big hand for all the panelists once again? And may I please request people who are sitting back, if we could come forward and take the seats, that will be great. Thank you. Thank you. That was a very generous introduction. Though the fellow panelists don't really require an introduction. We've all associated with them over the years and know them extremely well. And I'm delighted that they're here because I think we do need extensive and deep and long commitments from them. Uh, the first thing that an elephant reminds you of is sheer grandeur. Uh, if, if, even if you're not religious, but if you've read the texts, you would realize that the elephant is the only animal on which no god sits. No one mounts an elephant except maybe Indra, but Indra is now obsolete as a deity. So no god, other gods have peacocks, horses, lions, ducks, uh, you know, swans, various kinds of animals and birds, but nobody mounts an elephant. They're associated with the goddess of wealth, but even she does not dare to mount them. She is uh, they pour water and milk over her head, thus blessing her. So they are the blessers of gods, and they are, they are the blessers of forests. 
Interestingly, they are also described as Dekpals, or the guards of the four dishas, or the four directions. So they are basically animals with whom you don't miss. They show the paths, and you build our habitats and forests around the path. And they choose whom to bless and whom not to bless, and when to stop blessing those who they have blessed. So I think with that, uh, the, the elephant and his journey through the centuries is very interesting for us to watch because at the moment everything is all mixed up in our heads and everywhere else, even in the forest. I come from Uttarakhand where there is a complete mess about understanding either the forests or the mountains or the people who live on those mountains or the animals who traditionally lived there. And because of that, we have problems accepting elephants because towards the foothills of the mountains, there are dense forests where elephants have had paths for centuries. But now with the various kinds of tourism and religious tourism at that, human beings are becoming more violent. As they become more religious as tourists, they are becoming more violent. Some of the most violent tourists are religious tourists in India today. And they are causing a lot of danger, not just to animals, but even to human beings. Because if you can't protect and be tender and kind and understanding towards the animals, um, then it's a foregone conclusion that one day you'll cease to respect and love human beings also. So I think with that in mind, this very intelligent panel that I have, uh, I would just uh, start with Raj. Uh, animal welfare issues have been by now. We have no complaints that every major daily periodical covers animal conservation uh, issues regularly and extensively. And yet, most of the coverage, if you see, is uh, limited to incidents where there has been a culling or some kind of poaching or some kind of hunting some kind of extra legal or illegal activity. And in that context, the story comes up. There are very, very few stories in which elephants or indeed wildlife is connected with the actual problems that all of us are suffering, which is the debris of our age. Hindi mein usko hum log hai, sabhyata ka kachda, the civilizational <laughs> dung heap that our cities have become. And then the, uh, the impact of commercial activities, which are essential also, and religious tourism. And last but not the least, climate change. Raj, your thoughts on this? Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks so much, uh, Minal. And uh, firstly, let me compliment uh, Vivek uh, for putting this together. Uh, we are old friends, and it's uh, uh, just saw the range of uh, subjects that is being addressed. Uh, it's a wonderful festival looking at uh, uh, what we can do for the elephant. And as I researched this, he had asked me to speak, I began to uh, go back in time in some senses, because what you're saying, Minal, is that uh, wildlife journalism as we see it, and then Vivek and I were much younger, he has, his hair's <laughs> grayed, my hair's gone, as at the elephants, I see many of them, uh, when you look at the populations that were there 20, 30 years back. Uh, when you look at it, uh, wildlife journalism is a vanishing breed, uh, unfortunately, just like the species that's there. And uh, uh, when you look at uh, the coverage that you see, fair enough, there's episodical coverage that's there. Uh, what we lack in many senses is two things, I think, or three or things. Three things have happened since we all covered environment and development uh, simultaneously. Was um, in the beginning there was a lot of excitement about looking at forests first and wildlife, and uh, the coverage of that was extensive, particularly in magazines. Um, India Today was uh, did a lot of coverage, and I was happy to say that I did a lot of that as well. Uh, but as it went to climate change. Uh, in the beginning, we were conserving animals, uh, we were uh, wildlife, sorry, and um, there was this whole thing to also protect forests. But when it came to climate change, I felt the entire uh, 
thing got diffused a bit. Because then we were trying to cons save ourselves in some senses in the actions that we do, and then forgot what was happening around us. The second thing I think is that um, I do not see very great um, wildlife reporting of any kind. I'm sorry to say there might be some outstanding work I'm not discarding, but as a consistent, sustainable uh, this thing of journalism. They, I'm with, it, with, of course, Rahul and others, whatever work is being done, I'm not getting into that. Uh, and I think that excitement of journalism has gone in this respect. There's a lot more focus on what do we do about climate change, uh, you know, whether you're looking at um, global warming, looking at industry, looking at plastics now has become a big issue. But we tend to forget what's happening out in our forests and in, in a thing. And when I was listening to Mr. Ranjit Singh, and, you know, he was serving when I was uh, covering the beat, uh, I was pretty surprised to somewhat, and the other panelists, somewhat similar problems that we confronted with 40 years back or 30 years back when I began my career. I just happened to do a research, I mean not research, just got into Google uh, to check the Ministry of uh, uh, Environment and Forest website on elephants. And this is a day we're supposedly, uh, you know, focusing on it. But you please go into their website and you'll find that after the first page, you cannot click any of the links. I don't know whether, I, I thought it was my iPad that was a problem. No. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, you say elephant status in India and you click it, it goes to a blank page. I don't know if you all tried it as <laughs> if they're journalists here. And I was pretty shocked at that. I mean, um, uh, there was the director general who was sitting here, and the first thing I would do in a, in a, in a world that all of us are connected in, you know, so intimately than ever before is to brush up your website if you're having a major, and, uh, major program like this. And I was pretty surprised on that. The other thing is that uh, Vivek had mentioned in his brief that uh, let's talk about some personal incidents. I don't see Ajay Desai here, but uh, is he here somewhere or John Singh? Uh, oh, <laughs> sir. <laughs> John Singh and I had a very good, uh, you know, he taught me a lot. Let's put it that way about environment. And I remember uh, when Ranjit Singh Ji and others were talking about elephant corridors, the, in the 80s, early 80s, the first corridor that took a lot of interest was the Motichur Chilla corridor, which John Singh was there. And he, you know, I, I think journalists forget that one of the best things to do is actually do wildlife reporting and environment reporting, where you get fresh air. I've had, you know, bathed in the best and the <laughs> most pristine waterfalls, and John Singh was responsible in some of those when he took me to the river to have a bath. The, Perks of covering environment, unfortunately, seem to have been lost among a younger generation here. Because, I mean, the excitement of seeing uh, an elephant, I remember Ajay Desa and I had gone into the core area and we were discussing uh, what needs to be done, and this was in Bandipur. Oh, Ajay is coming from tomorrow, terrific guy. And of course, Vivek and all the pioneers that did so much work on elephants. Um, and Sukuma, where's Sukuma? Is, is he here somewhere? I mean, each of them taught us so much about, <laughs> and, and we were in this dense forest in, in, in Bandipur, looking at the core area. We shouldn't have gone in our vehicles, but that I was more sort of enthusiastic and pushed Ajay and other, others to land up over there. And we confronted a herd of elephants that began a charge. And then you realize how stupid you are as a journalist, because you really don't know what to do when an elephant begins to charge you. And we were in the car. Uh, and I don't know if, uh, I'm sure Vivek and others and who have covered <laughs> or have uh, done it know what it means. The fear of an elephant trumpet is awesome. I mean, there is one a trumpet which just seems very celebratory, but when it begins to charge you, your heart is in your mouth and you don't know what to do. Uh, and I do remember it was Ajay and his colleagues who pulled us out by the most curious of methods. Is to and it was d dusk and you couldn't see much. You could and they were actually protecting. They normally don't come towards you, but because there's a baby elephant, they thought uh, you know we were being at, uh, you know we would attack them, and they did the most curious thing, which still stays in my mind. I mean, this 40 years ago is that they put on the lights of the car. They someone slammed and this was a taxi driver. He didn't know how to really negotiate all these things. Someone put the horn uh, out and we were all supposed to bang the car and drive through the herd. I have never been so afraid of my life at that particular time when we rushed through the herd and they actually parted. I mean, they did part. So I'm just saying that, in, you know, we talk of war reporting, we talk of uh, doing political backslapping and reporting. I think people are missing out on the beauty of environment. 
I, I think journalists have to be passionate. It must come from within. It's not a, a, a dull subject. Uh, you know, uh, just to conclude, then I'm sure the other panelists, I did the entire Western Guards, and that also looked at the preservation of elephants. But I think as we talked earlier, uh, I mean, the discussion earlier, uh, while we do look at uh, elephants as, as a flagship species, we do need to protect the entire biodiversity and others, and they also get protected. You could use the Project Tiger method, where you, you take a central species and then you protect it, and they protect the environment, as we should do with elephant or rhinos, and you can do the bioconservation thing. And so I looked at the Western Guards, and fortunately, those days, uh, journalism had some money in terms of allowing us to tour. <laughs> and so I went from the Mahendrigiri Hills in, in the south to the Dangs in the north, I mean, in, 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 in Gujarat. And all the hotspots on the Western Guards I traveled to understand not just about wildlife and others, but what is going wrong with our forest. Because there was a famous Western Guards march. I'm talking this is mid, uh, maybe 90s that I did the trip. It must have taken me three months. But uh, the experiences that you have of talking to people, of frontline, of the, of the forester, and the equipment that is, and I've seen a lot of forest here, to deal with the problem. How do you deal with you know, the tribals around that area, the people that have to be settled? Uh, how, how do you deal with uh, poachers? And if you recall, that time, Virapan was big, and I used to write a lot on Virapan, who was the biggest elephant poacher since we are here. Who, we had a tape where he talked of how he brutally killed elephants that was there. And if you went down in the guards and went in each of those places, every place you visited, you had an experience. I don't know if you've seen the Malabar Hornbill. We saw that while, while going there. And it's this prehistoric creature that just flaps, and you think it's out of the blue, it comes at you, you know, two of them. The most beautiful sight. You might see it for 30 seconds, that's all. But you know, you're awestruck, or you see the king cobra very close to you. It happened when we were trying to look for the lion-tailed macaque, and it's, it was there, and they said, palm, as they say in Tamil Nadu, uh, we stood back, and we were lucky. We didn't go too close to it, and it moved. And when it moves away from you, uh, your heart stops. And when you see the tiger also, uh, if, you, if you see that, again, you're not equipped to handle all these things, because we are in a different urban jungle. You land up there, there your senses have to be perfect, your timing has to be perfect, every sound, every movement has to be, you know, you have to understand what the, the jungle is all about. So I'm saying that kind of excitement I don't see uh, happening in journalism today. And unfortunately, Minal, despite, despite the fact you have television, we used to do with still photographs to bring that excitement back, talk about vanishing forests, vanishing wildlife, uh, all the species that had uh, listed in WTI, I think, phenomenal amount of species that are there that we need to preserve and others. We used to highlight each of these. I don't see that. I don't know why television doesn't pick up one animal a day, uh, one wildlife a day, and talk about it and get people interested. I'm sure my son is interested, my daughter is interested. Uh, so I, I think journalism is failing itself. And I said, I think uh, we are all to blame in some senses that we are a vanishing breed, even as the forests and wildlife disappear. Thank you. I feel like trumpeting, <laughs> yes. uh, but um, Raj is quite right. We are living in silos. We in big cities do not come across the phenomena or the borderlines where human interests clash with animal interests and human love clashes with animal love. Again, in Uttarakhand, when I go to the villages, I talk to the villagers and some of them really truly hate the tiger because you know, habitations have been encroaching on tiger habitats. Tigers lift cattle, they lift little children, they attack women, and they are not allowed to touch a tiger. They told me, if our village is commissioner sahab jeep mein baith karke nainital se yahan a jate hain. Lekin agar hamare gaon mein 10 bachchon ko baag utha le jata hai, koi nahi aata, panchayat wale bhi kehte hain, chup karo, baag ka mamla hai, hum nahi padhenge. So somewhere or the other, I think, we have become, uh, we have grown calluses around us, and we don't really think about conflict zones. I think Mint has done seminal work in trying to break some of those uh, silos and flow into areas outside of big cities where the cities and the animals, where human beings and other animals come face to face. Uh, Sukumar, about conflict zones, and about your experiences of what media has 
or has not done and ought to be doing. Well, thanks, Mrinal, and uh, thanks, Vivek, for inviting me. Uh, I'm going to sound very boring after all those exciting stories that uh, Raj said, but you can only have so much of King Cobras in one session. <laughs> right? I'm, uh, I'm not going to go down that road. Um, and thank you, Mrinal, for what you said about Mint, although I've moved on from Mint. I, I have that. nothing I to do with Mint now. It's got a new editor. but. I and I'm hoping that, even but continue you were to the do. one who first broke yeah, thanks, the cycle. Yeah. Um, I think the problem, uh, and I'll come straight to the topic, because we're going to talk about coverage of elephants. elephants. And um, so I'm going to leave uh, my own experiences out of it, not that I've covered wildlife. I think the problem that covers wild, uh, the problem with wildlife reportage and wildlife coverage in India today is pretty much uh, in India today, not <laughs> his magazine, but in India today, okay. is, is pretty much uh, uh, the problem with all other reportage and coverage in the country today. And these are two or three issues that uh, are plaguing our profession and what we do. Uh, the first one is the lack of specialists. Right? I mean, this is a specialized topic. It is not um, meant for generalists. Uh, and by specialized, I don't mean you have to go and get a PhD in uh, wildlife biology or something else before doing it, but you have to work hard at it. Uh, it is sim very similar to how you would uh, write about the finances of a company, you have to know how to read a balance sheet, you have to know how to read a profit and loss account, you have to know about a cash flow statement, and pretty much you have to do your homework, you have to do a lot of reading, you have to do a lot of research, it is not easy. Uh, it is not the kind of thing that you can cover by just going to a conference and listening to two people say three different things and you write it down, you'll probably get many of the things wrong. So that's the first one. Uh, the second one is uh, complete lack of dependence on data. Um, across disciplines, uh, most journalists in this country do not know how to use data. Um, they make the fundamental mistake of uh, uh, confusing correlation for causation. So, you know, uh, and it's very easy to correlate two things, right? I mean, Sukumar speaks well on days Vivek wears a green shirt, right? I mean, and, and it, it's very easy to do something like that, but, you know, did it cost it? Uh, right? We would never know. But, but I think there is, and, and then the ability to look at data, to understand statistics, um, to really map that data and get to the bottom of it, because I think there is a wealth of information in data, uh, including wildlife data, which I don't think is tracked. And there is this data that's available. See, the interesting thing about government data is it's all there. It's there in formats that aren't easy to read, but it's there. Like one of the most interesting data pieces that we did when I was in Mint, and then I'm getting the team to repeat it for Hindustan Times, updating it by a few years, uh, is on forest fires in India. Now, you would think that there is not granular data that's available on forest fires, but you would actually be surprised at the level of data that is available, including there is a report that the first man on the scene filed saying what cost it, and that is also there, available there. So if you have a smart data team, the kind of data that they can really pull out and get is very interesting. The third thing is field work. I don't... And this, again, is a problem across disciplines because I think all journalists have gotten used to this whole thing of working over a phone, fax, surfing the internet. Um, I think it was Atlantic Monthly which carried this article which asked, as Google made us dumb, right? And I think it's true. It probably has. Um, and, and I think um, there has to be, uh, you know, you have to go out. There's no substitute for good old shoe leather when it comes to reportage, and especially on issues like this. If you want to write about uh, conflict, which Mrinal spoke about, because that's increasingly what you're seeing in the case of elephants uh, and leopards, right? I mean, human-animal uh, conflict. And I don't think there's enough work that is being done. The fourth one is a much more, and, and Raj uh, sort of uh, dwelt on it when he, and he mentioned it very explicitly also, right? I mean, budgets and everything else. I think there is a feeling in many mainstream newsrooms that there probably isn't room for things like wildlife. And, and I think this has probably got more to do with lack of imagination and lack of understanding than anything else. Because I think you can tell a good story on pretty much anything. So 
and and I think that should be the emphasis of what we are trying to do. So, um, which is what I did when we were at Mint, right? Uh, we had a wildlife reporter who would go out to the field, report stuff, uh, and it's some some of the things that you find out are fascinating, right? I mean, and um, at Hindustan Times now again, I'm I'm trying to get them to do the same thing again because. Um, Otherwise, our coverage of wildlife and conservation issues tends to be episodic. It tends to be around, oh my god, uh, number of tigers has gone down by so much, number of elephants has gone down by so much, uh, which really doesn't make too much of sense, right? I mean, it, it will get the attention of the reader for that one story, but beyond that, it, it's, it's really not going to get anything more. So, so I think um, there is room for that kind of coverage. Um, there are few newsrooms uh, that are willing to invest in that, but I think uh, there are enough readers out there who are interested in many of these things. I, I, I think uh, increasingly, uh, and this this is one of the things that actually makes me feel a little sad, uh, although there are points of hope. Uh, as the digital medium evolves, I mean, I mean, you've seen it in many countries around the world that there is a lot of room for in-depth wildlife reporting and writing that comes out, right? I mean, really good long-form articles that are being written based on solid research. Uh, you don't see too much of that in this country. You, you see a little bit of it, uh, but again, you, there's not enough to really make a difference. And, and it is definitely possible to do it, at least in the digital medium, because you, you're not plagued by uh, limitations of space and other things, uh, which most of the print publications are plagued by. I mean, Raj will tell you about the, the constraints that India Today has. I can tell you about the constraints that Hindustan Times has. Uh, Rahul will tell you about the issues that the Hindu has, <laughs> right? Uh, but I think even with those constraints, it is possible to do like a lot of interesting stuff if you have specialists if you give them the right tools, uh, which means you tell them this is how you do your journalism, this is how you report, this is how you use data. Um, and when I speak about expertise, I also speak about an understanding of science, right? I mean, if, if you look at uh, most Indian journalists, their understanding of science and math, and of course Raj is an honorable exception because early on he established himself as one of the preeminent science journalists of our times. But uh, their understanding of science and math is pretty, pretty bad and, and I think you need to find those people, make it attractive for them to work in your newsrooms and get them to do it. So I, I, unless you do that, um, we can sit here and talk about you know, uh, why coverage is so bad. So I'm just telling you some of the things that we did when I was at Mint and some of the things that we are now trying to do at Hindustan Times and, and I think the audience seems to like it. Uh, here we approach the elephant in the room the commercial potential of writing on elephants for the media today. You know, checkbooks are no longer what they were once upon a time. And the digital media is just struggling to keep its nose above water. Most of the good portals, which are trying to do a brave job, would love uh, to report extensively on these subjects. And they would love to have people who are knowledgeable but knowledgeable people also expect good money. I've time and again told owners that if you give peanuts, you get monkeys. But monkeys is mostly what, uh, you know, newsrooms. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I just want to add, right, because Mrinal raises a very fundamental issue about uh, finances. Go ahead. Um, I think, uh, you know, if you look at, um, there are many wise people around the world who've looked at emerging models of journalism. Right? And, and one of the most sustainable models of journalism, according to these people, is philanthropy, is patronage, uh, where you have uh, trusts and charities actually encouraging people to write about certain topics uh, because it makes sense, otherwise they wouldn't. So if you look at um, even a very, very, uh, even the Rockefeller Foundation, for instance, and, and you look at what, uh, they're hugely interested in urban issues and urban planning. So they fund a section in The Guardian where they obviously underwrite a lot of The Guardian's coverage in that area. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation again does it with The Guardian. I think they've tried to do it with a couple of Indian publications also where they 
uh, where their areas of interest are public health. So they are trying to underwrite that coverage. And I think um, maybe it, it, is, it, it will be possible to find similar or, or like-minded organizations and like-minded charities and trusts in India uh, which, which will be willing uh, to support that kind of coverage because it is, that is probably going to be a viable way of uh, new media as well as old media because The Guardian is old media, but The Guardian is, you know what The Guardian is. I mean, it's, a, it's not a non-profit, but it's a trust. Before I move to Rahul, one important point to underscore at this point would be that almost 70 to 80 percent of the uh, consumers of Indian media come from Indian languages. They do not read English. And most of the philanthropic foundations fund English language media, understandably because they can then see the results that they expect and evaluate them and decide to continue or not continue. Uh, so that is something that worries me. Now that I've retired, I see this even at, uh, you know, from a distance more clearly that uh, the linguistic caste system in India's media deeply affects wildlife reporting and it has bad repercussions because the, kind, the people who live close to the animals are really not very well off or extremely well educated and all of them, almost 90% of them, would be getting their information about the wildlife and the government's projects in Indian languages. In Tamil Nadu, for example, you, you go and spend a week in Periyar sanctuaries and you notice that most of the forest guards, most of the people you interact with, you know, read the Tamil dailies. Likewise, in Kerala, it's Malayalam. In West Bengal, it's Bengali. In Odisha, it's Odia. And in Assam, it's Ahamia. So I think that is something that the media and the potential funding, the, the funding agencies which want to push these uh, issues into the mainstream media must be very, very careful and study the patterns of consumption and the kind of information that needs to be conduited. Uh, uh, Rahul, um, on the, on, at this point, I would also like you to speak a little about the commercialization of tourism, especially ecotourism, which started as a very noble <laughs> Greenpeace sort of a movement, but which in states like Uttarakhand, in, the, in most of the northern states, for example, is just wrecking the uh, ecological balance uh, in the so-called holy rivers, around the so-called holy rivers and holy forests, breaking up the mountains and mountain roads. Um, Tamil Nadu has had sensible governments. It has had leaders who have not had an eye on one day speaking from the ramparts of the Red Fort. They have focused firmly on their people and their state and their own parties. Um, but Tamil Nadu is going, undergoing a churn also. So I would like you to speak a little on all of these linked subjects. Tamil Nadu is way beyond me. <laughs> anyway, uh, thing is, I am like a, you know, in army parlance, I am like a captain among generals because I'm more of a reporter. <laughs> So the thing is, I come from a region which is the lungs of India, you know. It's just 8% of India's landmass. But uh, if you have gone through the Forest Survey of India, the coverage of the report in February, most of the, report, the headlines were say that India, the forest cover in India has grown by 1%, but Northeast presents a worrying picture. It's just around 630 kilo square kilometer lost in the Northeast, but overall the states have 70%. So this is why the, my region is pretty important from the environment point of view. Anyway, um, basically in the Northeast, as I see it, you know, there are three broad areas of coverage. I would be jobless without the animals. Basically, <laughs> it's, either, it's either wildlife, militancy, or immigrants. Well, uh, militancy is gone case. 20 years ago, it was fine. And uh, hopefully after NRC, we'll, we'll also see the end of this issue called migrants. So when it is published. Well, we, as far as elephants are concerned, you know, uh, we have, I've grown up in that area when I was younger. This conflicts with, uh, you know, with humans is not a very new thing, but it, I, I have 
observed over the last few years, earlier it was basically during the winter periods when the food was less and they used to move out in search of food. Now it, it is just happening throughout the year, so which is a huge cause of concern. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, see, uh, when I am there, Mr. Chengapa said that uh, environment journalism is a rare bit. I, you know, every month I will have a one or two stories of animals to tell, even bats for that matter. What I do is, my job is to you know, present a story. And my job is to make a brief for my editor so that he understands and he gets the gist and, he, and make it so interesting that he doesn't, you know, trash that idea. So, so when this happened, when the Nipah virus happened, I went to a place in Nogao where you have a than, which basically is a, a temple kind of a structure called the Baduli than. So can you imagine a temple in the name of uh, bats? So this is where the, the bats are conserved. They're, they never, they never ever give it trouble. So these, these stories have come up. Also, so many stories have come up. It's how you approach a story. For example, I will approach a story from the other end of the animal. Maybe the elephants. My, my friend Koshik Borua knows. An elephant needs to poop every hour. So it, it digests 60 or 60 percent to 70 percent of its food undigested or semi-digested. So why does it need to poop every hour? My friend in, uh, Rothin Bonman will also know. How, how important it is for a you know, calf, rescued calf to poop. Because you know, a mother teaches, and a rhino in the wild will poop in the same place, and the mother teaches the calf to poop there. Without a mother, it's, it's very difficult for the rhino to poop. And, and unless the rhino poops, it's very difficult to ensure his survival. So these are the stories you know, we look at. So, so many interesting things happen. When you talk of commercialization, I don't think I am in the right place to, because <coughs> Apart from Kaziranga, we don't have much of a commercialization no. in, uh, in the yeah, Northeast. Yeah. And most of the places are usually, all the resorts are quite far from the... No. And of course, we have, we have a problem of these highway havas and you know, lou loud music. So I think this is going down. So commercialization is not much of a problem because in Kaziranga, even the people out there, they're very passionate about the animals. You know, you'll find even during... Uh, the floods, you'll find you know, people rescuing the animals, you know, letting them pass through their houses. So these, these things keep happening. So I'm not in a, the best position to talk about commercial, but uh, as, uh, what I feel is you know, there is space for uh, uh, stories to write on. For example, one of the best things that had happened, and I believe it's possible only, maybe it might be possible elsewhere, was three years ago, a village called Ram Terang in Karbi Anglong. You know, can you imagine, you know, there's a set of villagers who have been living there for ages, and through that village is an elephant corridor. So three years ago, all these people were, you know, decided to move five kilometers away. So they have a new village called New Ram Terang. They just vacated the villages for the elephants. So these are things that give you hope in this country. So even, even amid uh, NRC, even amid NRC, there were two, two important things happened with regards to the elephant. One was the demolition of a you know, NGT order uh, on a wall that had the Numaliga refinery had built around its complex and a golf course. So they had given a petition, review petition, to, to not let the entire wall be demolished, but the petition was overturned. So this one, this thing happened, and three days ago there was this elephant that was roaming around in the city. And the way it was, you know, Nobody ever bothered, no, no television, you know, this is the, what happens in local television. They find an issue, or even reporters, they ju they're just at it, you know. They'll just shove the mic into somebody's mouth or you know, into whatever body parts, you know. But this, <laughs> so, so th this was a very good thing that happened. The entire you know, rescue of the animal and the shifting, uh, shifting it back to the wild, uh, wildlife sanctuary, because you know, th this is something because we, we have grown up. Because I, every day I hear elephant's trumpet. Uh, you know, you, I hear a tiger roar, I hear a hula gibbon because I live very close to the Assam State Zoo. <laughs> so I, my house is pretty near. It's around 300 meters from the zoo. So uh, I, 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 every day I hear. But earlier when I was younger, we used to hear jackals. Well, we don't hear it now. I am fortunate enough in, uh, to live in a city which is woven around 11 reserve forests and a wildlife sanctuary. 
And every, on every given day, there are 200 kinds of mammals in and around Guwahati. So I, at the end of the day, I will say, you know, it's how you present a story. If you have a story to tell, and if you have an interesting way of, like the, like the pooping part, well, I, I, I believe it's a fantastic story. Because that's why, because the elephants have, need to eat so much, and elephants, uh, you know, and I've read somewhere the elephants grow more forest than they eat. So these are, these are interesting stories that can be told. And uh, that way, uh, that's because I, I keep on, because I have to be a jack of all trades. I'm not a master in anything, because I have seven states to cover. So I have compared, because of internet and, you know, Twitter, so I have compared the number of hits the stories take. I write about Torun Gogoi, I write about Bhoran Lamanto, there's hardly any traffic. There's, if, if I put the news on Twitter, there's not, no, hardly any response. Unless, of course, they abuse someone. <laughs> so otherwise, if I even write about bats, even if I write about uh, insects, butterflies, there's so many replies. So you know that people are interested in stories like that. And I think that's the way we can help in generating awareness. Uh, thank you. Um, we have some time. We have 10 minutes. Sorry? Uh, we have 10 minutes. Uh, now the, I, yeah, yes, I, I would know. like all three of you to give brief comments about uh, the laws on conservation such as we have and frequent rulings from the courts that come. For example, the Uttarakhand High Court ruled that rivers are to be treated, rivers rights have to be treated on par with human beings. Rivers are like human beings, and therefore they're... Which was overturned by the Supreme Court. Which was overturned by the Supreme Court. And I think it was, there was a point in it, because at the same time, reports coming in from Uttarakhand were saying that the government's own programs for widening the roads uh, were being carried out by government contractors who were dumping all the rubble from the mountainside into the rivers, and thus creating a Kedarnath-like situation, which come the rains could pose a great danger to the surrounding area. So I would like you, all three of you, to briefly comment on this particular aspect, if you would. Uh, I'll, I'll come to that, but I think uh, a couple of points that Sukumar had raised and as well as uh, Rahul had mentioned. Uh, one is uh, the need for specialists uh, in, uh, in wildlife reporting or forest reporting. Uh, I don't think that's an issue. Uh, and I'm saying it quite honestly. Uh, in the sense that these are subjects that uh, if you take any of these uh, areas that we're covering, whether it is, uh, for instance, trade uh, in wildlife, uh, poaching, uh, a crime reporter can do a damn good job. It doesn't require, he just has to have the interest to know and uh, find out. And uh, as you explore that, uh, you will find there's so much to report on that you don't require the specialization. The specialists are here. We don't have to be like, uh, you know, cricket commentators play the game. Uh, so that you have Gavaskar comment on something. Uh, you just have to be a very good reporter uh, who has the passion, interest in the subject. And then you have great specialists, whether it's Vivek, I see Dr. Baruchas uh, come in here, and uh, Mr. Ranjit Singh, and everybody else that uh, you, you sort of uh, worked on to, uh, uh, to, to get the information. So you just have to be a very good reporter, and you will find, take the key areas that we're looking at, whether it is uh, poaching, um, and there's still a major, major problem. We had exciting stuff that is uh, sadly sad stuff when Virapan was alive and we could go and cover that and it was a different, uh, you know, a kind of interest in the country. It was a top, a top report story. But even here, if you take a look at the poaching, what is being done with the ivory, where's the ivory lining up, whether it's in Japan, whether it's in China, whether it's in the Middle East, what people are doing with it, they are great stories to be done. People will read these things. The second area that you're talking about, the man-animal conflict or the elephant uh, corridor conflict. I mean, when uh, Johnson and I, we were looking at the first conflict in Modichur and Chilla, those days, 40 years back or something like that. But now you look, 100 such corridors have cropped up. Each of these are stories, not just uh, for national dailies or television, but also for all the local papers. I mean, they are fighting that battle. They are also being trampled or the, uh, you know, their uh, crops are being lost and they want a solution. It isn't that they would like to kill the elephant. They would also like to preserve that. But how do we do that? All the tracks that uh, cut through many of these places, roads that cut through. I come from Karnataka. We have the largest amount uh, of elephants in the country, 6,000 or so. Uh, and there also the roads cutting through the forest and the kind of uh, 
problems that you have. Again, I don't think it requires specialists. I think you can just have good, honest journalists land up over there, talk to the specialists who are uh, dealing with the issue, and present a report either for television or for print. Uh, and uh, what is the other area that you're looking at? You have this 101, then you've got the, um, the uh, poaching problem. You've got elephant uh, conservation and preservation of it. Again, let's look at it there. I think uh, 24 reserves uh, that have been declared or a little more. I, I'm not sure now what's the exact number. But what a fan fantastic story to do, to go inside those reserves and see whether they're really being maintained. There is conservation norms that are there. Again, not rocket science. And I'm saying this because you, uh, if I go back to the forest, I'll be back to A, B, C, D. I'll have to start all over again to ask all the specialists, to ask them the questions, the right questions, and you get the answers. There, if you look at it, again, whether the core area is preserved, what are the issues, uh, the tribals that are there, the conflicts that happen on it, are they being preserved properly, and uh, what can be done. Great stories to do, uh, particularly for local dailies that are dealing with that issue. And if you look at the man-animal conflict or man-elephant conflict, uh, you have a death a day, I think, because of elephants. Or maybe there's an elephant killed a day as well. So there is, a, it's a serious problem. If you write about it, as Rahul was saying, you'll get the traction on the net on this. Now when it comes to uh, the law which you're talking about, I just want to also briefly talk about tourism that you said. I think it's very important not to look at, um, at uh, wildlife conservation of forests as a kind of pristine thing that the public shouldn't be involved with. If you don't get the public interested, you will not be able to save the forest. If you don't get them to appreciate what it means to go out and see an elephant in the wild or a tiger in the wild or see, uh, forget the zoos. I mean, that's just one aspect of getting a young child interested, but you have to feel the forest. You have to see, feel the way the jungle is constructed. You have to feel the fear of the jungle. You have to see how inadequate you feel when you land up, as I was mentioning earlier, that you don't really know how to deal with the jungle. And that requires people to go out there and see it. And I think tourism is, is a way, if it is controlled and regulated, uh, is a great way to present why it's so important. Uh, once you go there as a tourist, I just did the Chardam in your home, <laughs> home state, and you think, wow, I'd love to keep this going. You're not going to be a destroyer. You'd say, why can't we have better facilities here or this, and make sure it's limited to this, regulated. So you join the public debate. So I think it's very important that you get down to doing that. In terms of law, as I was just mentioning, uh, you know, the Environment Ministry and uh, Dr. Ranjit Singh is there. It started off with the agriculture and uh, there was never a separate Department of Environment. It then became an Environment Ministry uh, when I was reporting it. And uh, uh, and then was one of the most open ministries that you could get because a lot of NGOs, a lot of wildlife specialists and everything else came forward to do the work that was there. There was a tremendous movement in the 80s. I mean, you had to go with it uh, till about the mid-90s, I would say, that you found people, you know, not only good researchers coming up, uh, doing dedicated stuff, uh, and then you could report about it. So there was an excitement about it. As you're saying, then you have to now work out the Ministry of Environment and Forest is subsumed by climate change, for instance, on a lot of the big issues that are there. Where today, because um, the world is talking about it, when uh, you know, I covered Rio, I've been to Paris uh, to see the climate change, you have world leaders talking about the problems that we used to talk about and everybody ignored in the 80s. But that world leadership is now talking, when we take a look at forests, if you're talking about it, why divorce the two? I, I know uh, Vivek has a kind of a, <laughs> a blinker in when it comes to elephants in this conference. But uh, <laughs> uh, when, you take, when you take a look at uh, how much has the government done on, say, it says that it wants to, uh, because they have to pr provide the green cover for carbon sinks, it is going to develop this many forests. How many reporters, and we were talking about uh, on, on this aspect, how many people have actually gone? I was part of the Prime Minister's Council for Climate Change, the previous one, right, for about eight years. There were terrific projects that came up. How many of us have actually gone and checked how much of those forests have actually come up? Where have they come up? What have we done with those things? I mean, accountability is a very critical. Laws could be something, yes. The law, then you must find out what is whether it's been implemented properly, what are the kind of laws you require, the regulation you require. But I think as journalists, uh, these are terrific subjects to look at. We all sort of run after the politician, run after these. You just have to go out there and dig and find out. And I'm telling you, you'll have the best and the most enjoyable drives 
because you get fresh air, you see the forests, you see the wildlife, and at the same time you do your job, you're getting paid to do that job. So Rahul, you're lucky in that sense. <laughs> yeah, it is fun. So I, I think there the accountability question must come in. In each of these uh, things that we're talking about, we had, uh, as I was mentioning, I would be appalled to find that the website of the Ministry of Environment and Forests is not updated on elephants. I mean, someone should be <laughs> hauled up for that particular thing because you are dissuading a lot of people from looking at the key issues. And I, I think the journalists, when we're looking at this thing, there are about five or six big areas that is, you know, a journalist can build his entire career on if he really wants to focus on wildlife and environment. And uh, you would take each of these and boil it down, uh, I mean, not boil it down, but get into the nuts and bolts, the granular part, you will find that you are, you are getting far more traction, far more excitement than just doing routine stuff. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Sukumar. Your thoughts? Okay, I won't uh, spend a lot of time disagreeing with Raj. I mean, whether you have specialists or generalists, it doesn't really matter. My experience has been that specialists work better at almost anything. Uh, if generalists work for him, so be it, right? I mean, uh, I think um, Rinal raised an interesting point about laws, right? And and. Uh, conservation laws and everything else. And I think, um, first of all, I, I think uh, many of the environment issues end up before the tribunals or the courts, right? And, and, and so our coverage of it ends up being very focused on that legal aspect. And um, clearly there, I think what we've realized over a period of time, yeah. No, and, but I also think that what happens there is you have a bunch of rulings and no real follow-up, right? I mean, um, none of these rulings ever seem to be sacrosanct, right? I mean, look at the number of NGT rulings even on uh, old vehicles in Delhi which are not being implemented because they have there is no policy to do it. And I think uh, what we really need from that perspective is uh, much like in many other areas where we are evolving laws, privacy, for instance, data protection. We had no laws, we're just evolving. I think we need a comprehensive law. Um, and we also need a law which is very, very process specific. Because I think when you look at many of the government's policies and other things, they, they're very black box oriented. It, it's like, um, because maybe because we're all Indians and we believe in God and we believe in miracles. We believe that we press a button and something will happen, right? I mean, there's a black box. You press a button. Um, you want to save the elephant. You launch a campaign. The elephant gets saved, right? And it doesn't happen that way. I, I think you really need to understand uh, what the issues are, ground level issues. Uh, you'll have to understand the science behind it. And I think the law needs to factor these things into place. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I said we need specialists, right? So um, I think we have well-meaning laws, but, but I think we also sometimes have laws that uh, don't really get implemented well. We, we've been trying to clean the Ganges for God knows how long, and, and, and we've had uh, very, very uh, poor results when it comes to that. And where do you strike the balance, right? I, I think law has to strike the balance. Tourism is a classic point. Um, I, I think uh, uh, the mobile phone is probably the worst thing that could have happened to wildlife tourism. Uh, the number of human monkeys who try and go and take selfies with wildlife result in, in all kinds of issues. I mean, uh, but that's what you see. So uh, uh, tourism is a double-edged sword. So where do you strike the balance, right? I mean, and I... I and I think our laws have really not understood this issue of trade-offs. Um, I think the courts that rule on environmental issues probably don't have adequate powers. Uh, and it is one of those issues where there is a lot of noise, but there is actually very little action. Uh, you look at river linking, for instance. Um, has there been enough science that has gone in there um, from the government side to understand the ramifications of this, uh, where the laws have been, where there have been legal challenges to this, have these been argued out properly? Where there have been rulings, have these been followed? Uh, and I think it's, but like I said, you know, we are all optimists. I'm hoping that we will, at some point in time, arrive at a cogent law uh, which addresses these issues. 
I'm no one to speak about laws, but I think there are enough laws if they are properly implemented. I agree with him. There are enough laws, and I also think, you know, ancient beliefs and superstitions, you know, involved with animals, they should also be, you know, nurtured pretty well. I remember uh, around 15 years ago, you know, there was uh, this uh, I forgot the name of that wetland in the East Coming District of Arunachal Pradesh. I did a story on that. On uh, uh, the minister, you know, he was pretty, he didn't know what to do because the, that wetland was, people were fishing so much, you know, people were like, destroying the animals and uh, uh, they had a lot of eels and that tribe, the tribe believed that if you kill the eels, you know, the ghost of the eel will come, come back and trouble you. So this man played on that, you know, superstition and he helped, you know, prevent a lot of free overfishing out there. So if, you, if this can be done, for example, the Nishi tribe, the Nishi tribe, they consider the tiger as their brothers. So if you kill a tiger, among, if you are a Nishi and if you happen to kill a tiger, you have committed the biggest crime on earth. So all these stuff, if you can, you know, weave into your environment, but I, I don't see any harm in that. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, just a quick po couple of points. One, when we are making the laws, I think very, very critical that uh, we've had these kind of things in the past where you just cordon off. You create islands uh, that Mr. Ranjit Singh was talking about, and you don't involve the people in those laws. You don't take into account the ground realities, and then you have conflicts, and people violate the law. And this has been a debate that we've had for many years when you looked at whether the tribal law is coming, the land rights for tribals, for all these various issues. So it's very important while doing those, uh, that we bring the human element into it, because in this, it's all about uh, living beings. It's not dead stuff that you're looking at. The second point I'd like to make is that uh, one of the, the difficulties, I, I would think, and that's the, that's the reason, is while you do need codified stuff, and I was present as mentioning at Rio, uh, to me the U Rio conference w might have been a landmark conference in terms of climate change, but as a journalist covering it, it was the most boring conference to cover. Because all it did was it had brackets, it had various uh, countries making their statement, they all fought on those statements, what they should draw up, this particular word, and environment was missing. And the only time we really had, uh, I mean, all of us were, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, didn't have a dry eye, was when a Red Indian, a Native American chief, spoke so beautifully about the environment, when he talked about their forefathers, how the thundering gods, uh, you know, would preserve the, the thing. The language that he used made us feel that we were, we had to care for the forest. I think a lot of environment reporting has to come from the heart, from the passion to feel it. You bring in laws, they are pretty boring, you know, on a lot of these things. Therefore, I think even while formulating the laws, get people involved in it, debate it, make sure that uh, it takes into consideration the human aspect. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. And thank you, Sukumar. And thank you, Rahul. Uh, this is all riveting. I'd just like to finish with a very interesting story from my own childhood. Uh, when I was quite little, the first time a circus came to the little hill town where I was, and people had never seen an elephant. That was the first time the circus had walked all the 46 kilometers up from Haldwani um, with an elephant. And all the women in the city uh, said that he was an avatar of Lord Ganesha, and so his poop, Rahul, his poops sold for 10 rupees in the 1950s, 10 rupees per ball, you know? And you saw <laughs> Brahmin women with their heads covered <laughs> going around with brass platters <laughs> buying poop <laughs> because it was Ga Ganesha's prasadam. <laughs> so, Right, right. So in those days in Almora, at least it was holy elephant. So thank you all so much for being here, and thank you, my fellow panelists. I've learned a lot. Thank you, and thank you, Vivek, for having all of us.